Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go unto her, for my time is completed. For Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The hit TV show, How I Met Your Mother, ran on CBS for nine years. It was the story of Ted Mosby, uh, played by Josh Radner, <clears throat> along with his group of friends in Manhattan. And it used a framing device to move the storyline along. Ted is telling stories in the year 2030 to his son and daughter about his young adult escapades in New York that led at last to the marrying of their mother. Viewers are drawn into the story by wondering who this woman will eventually turn out to be. The last episode brings a twist that proved unsatisfying to many viewers and critics, but how could it not after nine years, right? Well, in our continuing stories of the patriarchs this summer, we've come to the point of Jacob meeting his wife, or in this case, his wives. It's also a story of concealed identity and an unsatisfying twist at the end. Jacob's courtship got me thinking about this TV show because uh, like this TV show Jacob, is, it, this is being told long after the events have actually happened. And likely Jacob has been telling his children and then the children's children over a long period of time, uh, basically how I met your mothers. Jacob, you see, is the father of 12 sons and one daughter, the 12 sons becoming the 12 tribes of Israel. How those children came to be and whose mothers they were compels our attention, though not our imitation. Now, it's common these days for Christians and politicians uh, to talk about the biblical definition of marriage, right, as being one man and one woman for life in a one flesh relationship. And I want to praise that definition as a hard won achievement across thousands of years that has served us well as far as it goes. It's important to note, though, that it didn't come about all at once. And the matter is still not settled just because some of us want to say it is. As early as 1831, the founder of the Mormon church, Joseph Smith, practiced and taught plural marriage like Jacob's as a restoration of the biblical understanding of marriage. He had 40 wives although his first wife, Emma, was never 
happy about the other 39, don't you know? <laughs> Imagine that. Even Mormons now agree that plural marriage is a pattern best left to the dustbin of history. Yet other patterns of marriage have come to be accepted in our lifetime, and yet only with great difficulty. Interracial marriage, for one, right? There was a time when everyone was saying it's simply unnatural, right? Serial marriage for another. Not the breakfast kind of cereal, I mean, <laughs> cereal in the sense of having been married more than once, though not to this, at the same time. Well, you get the idea. These weren't easy to figure out for the church. They required great discernment and great grace. And as some forms of marriage were being rejected, like plural marriage, and others being accepted, like interracial and serial marriage, resistance to change was always there, and often by an appeal to the Bible. It wasn't until the 1970s in our church that we actually started ordaining never married single persons to be deacons. It wasn't until 1991 that we began to ordain women or divorced persons who had been remarried. Then last fall, most of our church said that they could now imagine the godly blessing of two people of the same gender being married. And to say that that was an easy move to make would be a lie. We are still learning to live into it together and some honorable good friends among us still see it as an unfaithful departure from biblical marriage. But what I'm saying to you today is this. Everything in the Bible is useful to us in our struggle to understand what the Spirit is saying to the church today. This story of Jacob, for instance, that ends with him being married to two sisters and having children by them, as well as having children by each of their maids, right? All of those children end up being considered legitimate children, by the way, and heads of the tribes of Israel, even this is useful. See, it's easy to say that there is one biblical view of marriage until you read the Bible. Well, really, you know, there are many examples of marriage in the Bible, and some of these, like plural marriage, have lost their moral force for us today. That didn't happen all at once. But there is, I believe, a trajectory of things in the Bible that led to some patterns being rejected and others being accepted. And experience plays a bigger part in this than we want to admit sometimes. For example, as divorce hit more and more of our families, people we love who are close to us, it forced the church to take another look at whether we could find room for the gospel to work in divorced persons' lives too. Laws whether civil or church, that trap people in abusive relationships ended up being overturned, thank God, which has had the positive and frankly negative effects of making it easier for people to get divorced. But most churches have now decided that it's better to welcome divorced persons in the church rather than keeping them outside of it. Now you often hear of people pointing to the institution of marriage coming right at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. But it's important to note that the Genesis story in chapter 2 about marriage being between a man and a woman was actually written during the time of King Solomon, which was about 900 B.C. It came from the court of Solomon himself. And at that very time that this was written, King Solomon had 
700 wives and 300 concubines. This seems rather inconsistent, don't you think? And then there's this. Jacob lived in a time when people believed that marrying within the family was the way to go. His grandparents, Abraham and Sarah, were half-siblings. His father, Isaac, was married to the daughter of his cousin. Then Jacob marries his first cousins. They believed that keeping things in the family protected the tribe and kept the lineage pure. And we now know that this kind of incestuous marriage actually does the opposite. It weakens the gene pool and makes the family vulnerable in all sorts of ways. Jacob's courtship of Rachel that ends with him getting Leah first, right, reminds us that no marriage begins perfectly. (laughs) We already know that no marriage ends perfectly, right? Jacob was a trickster, conning his brother Esau out of his birthright and blessing, and now this story, he gets his comeuppance. So he goes for Rachel, and Laban, his uncle, substitutes the older sister Leah. The trickster is tricked himself, gets what he deserves. Reminds me of another story. A classic car lover was perusing the classified section one weekend when he came upon a find that he couldn't believe. A 1966 cherry red Chevrolet Corvette being offered for $100. Well, was it a wreck? He had to know. So maybe the price was a misprint? So he called and a woman answered and he asked her about it and she confirmed that the car was in excellent shape and there was no mistake about the price. He dashed right over. To his delight, the car was everything the woman reported. Of course, he told her he would take it right away and started writing out his check for $100 but his conscience got the better of him and he said, ma'am, I have to tell you that this car is worth far more than $100. You could make a much higher price. Oh, I know that, she said. But you see, my husband left me and ran off with his secretary. And he told me he didn't want anything from our marriage. I could keep it all except his beloved Corvette. He wanted me to sell it and send him the money. A hundred dollars. Come up and... Notice, too... Neither Leah nor Rachel gets any say in all of this that happens. It's all arranged by the men. We can be sure the slaves of each woman who had children by Jacob weren't consulted either. Over time, though, this biblical understanding of male domination in marriage had to go. Marriage had to become about two consenting adults. It's taken a long time to get to the place where our default understanding of marriage should be based upon mutual love between equal adults. Long time. In fact, it wasn't until about 250 years ago during the Victorian era, that romantic love came to be thought of as the essence of marriage. And it wasn't until about 50 years ago that marriage started being really defined as a partnership among, between equals rather than defined by gender roles, not to mention the legal implications of women having equal standing in the law to their husbands. And yet, I want to say this to you, even in all of what we now would consider to be imperfect and inferior patterns of marriage across the centuries, God has worked God's grace because that's what God does. Gratefully, 
Our civil laws have been moving us toward the full dignity and equality of all persons, including with regard to marriage. I believe that's not a purely secular development, but it is actually grounded in the nature of the liberating gospel itself. God has been at work in God's typical slow and steady way to transform relational structures like marriage and family into places of greater grace. Sometimes God has worked through the church culture to help shape the wider culture. And sometimes God has been at work through the wider culture to help shape the church culture. Because God will not be confined to our way of working. Since, as we sing to our grandchildren, Kim and I, he's got the whole world in his hands, right? Which leads us to another part of the whole world that God is working to transform in the church. Last week, one of our Wilshire bloggers, Christy Walters, wrote about her sister Karen's death from the AIDS virus in 1995. Seems she had contracted it from her husband, Jay. Jay had moved to Dallas from a small East Texas town and became the organist at their little church in Pleasant Grove. Jay was gay, but he married Christy anyway, as so many have done in order to survive by hiding in plain sight didn't work, and Jay eventually left her, and sadly he left her HIV positive. All this left Christy angry too. Here's what she said, I was angry at our minister of music for knowingly bringing a gay man to our church where I was convinced he didn't belong because anger and hurt want to blame everyone but the real problem. He didn't belong here, was my thinking at the time. The sad part is that I never gave it any thought about where he might actually belong. I think that's the bigger story. The real problem was that for nearly forever, gay men, women, teens, whoever, more often than not, had no place to belong outside the communities they created for themselves to support each other. She's right. And some of you in this room know more about that personally than some of the rest of us. The story of Karen and Jay raises questions for the church in our day as we continue to wrestle with marriage in the church. But before I name some of those questions, I also want to offer two important caveats to you. The first is this. We must not continue unfairly to identify AIDS with being gay, even if it disproportionately struck the gay community. And the second is that we should hold singleness in high regard in the church. That being married is not everything, and it's a laudable state for some, and a calling even for others. But with that said, I want to ask you this. What if Jay had had the opportunity to live an honest life of love and faithfulness in a covenant, same-sex relationship that honored God? What if the church were the place that they could truly belong as a couple and maybe as a family? Because the church has precisely the structure called marriage that fosters security and stability. How many young lives might yet be saved and hearts open to the Lord because of same-gender marriages that give them hope by the good and godly examples of these couples and families? In the Supreme Court decision two summers ago, Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote these powerful words. No union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideals of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were, 
as some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. The Constitution may grant that civil right now. But I tell you, the church has something more right even to say about all marriages. That is, they are intended to glorify God. They are meant to be an arena of grace, a witness to God's abiding love and a fount of blessing. Perhaps someday soon we will see God do something beautiful among us through these marriages too. It wouldn't surprise me a bit. Considering all the kinds of marriages God has worked grace through from Bible times until our time, all of them were imperfect instruments of God's perfect love. Amen.